Um, so for our next presentation, we would like, uh, this is going to be uh, pre presented by John Walter and from NOAA, NOAA Fisheries. And John, I invite you to come off mute and step in. All right. Thank you. And uh, thank you to Boehm for hosting this. I'm uh, Dr. John Walter. I'm the Deputy Director for Science and Council Services at the Southeast Fisheries Science Center in Miami, Florida. I am calling in from Reedville, Virginia, which is the fourth largest port by volume for uh, nationally for its menhaden fisheries. So it's uh, uh, glad to actually be at the site of one of our big fisheries. And I, this is a very uh, timely that Walt uh, that, that um, the, the previous presentation actually showed this figure. And I thank Walt for the very comprehensive overview of a lot of the spatial dynamics of where wind is likely to occur. And we're very excited to see this happening in the Gulf. We're excited about the developments that are going on. And I'm going to be speaking about the data that we bring to the table as NOAA Fisheries and the trust resources that uh, we have to consider both by regulation as well as uh, due to the potential impacts on them of uh, this uh, these developments. So uh, I've put the presentation here largely on the basis of this spatial map that you see on the first page of the slide and overlaying where a lot of our trust resources occur relative to this. So if we go to the next slide, please. One thing that I'll note with some uh, excitement, in fact, is that we've done this before in the Gulf of Mexico. We have successfully, uh, one of the, the most successful uh, oil and gas uh, actually developments in, uh, in the, the world in the Gulf of Mexico and some of the most productive fisheries. And so we've been able to balance both of those things. And one of the things that's exciting is that we're basically at the start of a new industry and we're taking time back to the beginnings of the first offshore oil patent in 1869, the first offshore rig in 1947. And then if I don't think anyone at that time would have believed that the Gulf of Mexico would then look like the National Geographic map in the upper right corner where it's inundated with oil and natural gas infrastructure. What we have is, is a unique opportunity to get science in at the beginning of the start of this and to be able to evaluate uh, any potential impacts and mitigate them um, at the at the get-go. And this is something that we almost didn't have at the beginning of oil and gas, and now we have this opportunity, and I think we, we really should seize this opportunity. Next slide, please. So I'll be speaking of four, and I mean, numbers are all, all just one due to some, uh, some things strange here. We have four science buckets. And within the agency, we've been talking about the four things that we really uh, need to address because of a lot of our mandates. And my colleague Noah Silverman addressed the regulatory support, where we have a number of regulatory mandates for our trust resources. Our other partners within NOAA at NOS have other regulatory mandates. And we as a science center have to provide a lot of support to that regulatory process. And that's our second bucket, and that's providing information about where our animals might be in space where our fisheries might overlap uh, to be able to conduct the site assessments and NEPA analyses. Then there's the impacts of wind on our federal surveys and our science advice. We have a number of very long time series surveys that may be affected by this because it may uh, be difficult for them to survey around these and it may affect uh, how we actually survey our natural resources. In addition, given the likely comprehensive nature of what might happen if wind comes to its the full uh, realization of the administration's goals, we're going to have a substantial amount of infrastructure in the water and it may have ecosystem level impacts. And that's something we've definitely seen with oil and gas infrastructure where it's had effects that were at the scale of the ecosystem. And so it may affect how we give science advice. And then uh, lastly, we've got to understand the interactions with our NOAA trust resources, primarily the, the natural resources as well as the fisheries. Next slide, please. So we have uh, about 274 year combined scientific surveys in the Gulf of Mexico, ranging from our flagship white ship surveys, including tr our trawl surveys that cover almost the entire Gulf of Mexico, to longline surveys, uh, visual surveys, and a number of uh, sort of plankton surveys, and then uh, something that's funded by BOEM, which is the GOMAPS survey for 
protected species and seabirds and marine mammals. And you could see the survey for the prints of each of the surveys or the universe at which the surveys actually cover are mapped here on the left with each of the uh, the areas and the economic values of those areas for wind development are mapped in here as actually color coded as lines here with the actual survey footprint. So you can see where those surveys might be affected or, or overlap with wind development areas, which tells us two things. One, we've got a lot of data to bring to the table to identify what might be there and what might be affected. We also have surveys that we may need to work to deal with mitigation and that's something that there's a recent MOU with BOEM to deal with mitigating survey impacts because we need to be able to continue with all, all of our overall missions here. And here on the, the right is a table that describes each one of the surveys. I won't go into the, the details of them but the surveys cover pretty much the gamut of all of our, our trust resources as well as our ecosystem mandate. Next slide. We've also got substantial fisheries and the Gulf of Mexico is 15% of the total value of commercial landings and 15% of the total landings in 2018. Shrimp is our number one fishery in value at over 420 million and Menhaden here is the top in volume. And so we have very substantial commercial fisheries operating in the Gulf of Mexico. And you can see the time series of landings in the, on the left and the time series of commercial revenues. And if as well, rec our recreational fisheries are also some of the most valuable in the country. It supports more angling trips than the rest of the nation combined and more jobs and sales than any other region. And so our recreational fishermen are very vocal. They're uh, highly uh, influential and very active stakeholders. And one, they comprise a substantial component of uh, the national fishermen. Next slide. So I alluded to shrimp fishery, which is our most valuable commercial fishery, which uh, the uh, bulk, a lot of the effort comes from the western part of the Gulf, both in Louisiana and Texas. And this map shows the uh, color coding of the highest uh, effort areas from electronic logbooks. We, so we have a very rich data set to be able to identify where the fishery is operating and where it might be impacted. And as you can see in that western planning zone uh, where they, they are more valuable like right now for wind scoping also happens to be a quite valuable area for the shrimp fishery to operate. Uh, Texas has uh, a large component of the total value in its of shrimp catch and the area off of Brownsville is a substantial amount of the total fishing effort. So as well as areas off of Louisiana, and Western Louisiana and uh, the rest of Texas. So our shrimp fishery is probably one that's going to be uh, very much focused on wind developments and something that we would have to, to pay close attention to how it might impact them as well as similar to how uh, analyses to look at the potential economic impacts in the uh, of in the northeast center where the, there are valuable scallop fisheries as well as ground fish fisheries that uh, may have been affected and may be affected by wind development. Next slide. I alluded to our recreational fisheries, and here you can see each of the five states in the Gulf, which have substantial economic value to our fisheries of over 13.5 billion in trips and durable goods. One thing that is rather unique about the Gulf of Mexico is that a lot of the fisheries really were prosecuted and are prosecuted on oil and gas infrastructure that has for many years has been a hot spot for fishing, both of in for inshore reef fish as well as for offshore and pelagic fish. And so one of the things that we've heard from our fishermen is that access to these fishing opportunities is of a high priority and, and perhaps the, that the wind infrastructure may in fact provide fishing opportunities and uh, as long as they continue to be able to have access to them. And so that's something that I think that stakeholder community is going to be paying very close attention to. Next slide. So I, I alluded to the Gold Map Survey, which is funded by Mo, BOEM as one of our, our partners in evaluating a lot of our trust resources. And in particular, marine mammals and sea turtles have both a special regulatory mandate for the Marine Mammal Protection Act, as well as endangered species mandates. And 
that GoMaps provides a very valuable and rich data source to be able to put these animals in space and time to be able to identify where they might overlap with any potential image development. And here you see a map on the lower left of the uh, draft spatial density model for uh, bottlenose dolphins. So this allows us to be able to build models that tell us where those animals might be and where they might have overlap. But we've used them very successfully for a lot of the oil and gas infrastructure siting, for oil and gas removals, as well as a large number of other things that are related to the industry in the Gulf of Mexico. Next slide, please. You may be hearing a little bit of feedback. I believe the anchor is coming up on our boat right now. Um, so one of the things that I alluded to is our ability to produce probability maps of overlap in areas of high concern. And this is a probability map that was done for the aquaculture area of opportunity. And this was a, actually a recent, and I'll highlight this, this project that was done to scope out areas for aquaculture opportunity. It was really a very comprehensive set of spatial planning tools to be able, done by NCOS as well as by NIMS to be able to build and develop areas that might be suitable for aquaculture. It's an exercise that could be quite well adapted to wind scoping as well. And then in this case, what we've done is overlaid uh, where we have know about animals in space, in particular Gulf of Mexico birdies whale, which is our, our, a unique species of whale, five sea turtles, small tooth sawfish, and giant manta ray. And then combining their probability of occurrence with their status as in terms of their threatened status to map out where they would likely be most heavily impacted by any kind of spatial map planning process. In this case, this is done for water depths of 50 to 150 meters. That's the reason you see this relatively narrow distribution. But these are the kind of things that the rich data sets that we've got can allow us to do. We could do some very similar for whatever either uh, is planned in, in federal waters shallower than this, or in fact, for state waters. And I will note that most of our trust resources don't know the difference between state and federal waters. So they go uh, with impunity back and forth between them. So uh, we, we're, while a lot of the planning exercises have been separated between state and federal, a lot, as we heard, the state, anything is going to have to actually have uh, transmission lines to go through state waters, and our species will cross them too. Next slide, please. In addition, we have a lot of habitat management and essential uh, fish and coral habitat. And here I've overlaid what are some of the coral habitats in the west, uh, western part of Texas, where in particular there's a size advantage, a coral with a lot of uh, soft corals, black corals, and stony corals in state waters. There's also a lot of unmapped coral resources in these areas uh, that we have yet to actually discover. And so th those will have to of the discussion and planning process. Uh, next slide, please. And then one of the real backbones of our fisheries, as well as our ecosystem, are the fish and invertebrates. And our ground fish survey, which is a trawl survey that's been going on for many years, can actually put those resources in space. And here's a map on the right of the mean relative abundance of all the ground fish biomass in space, which tells us where are the highest biomass areas. The high of, of many of these species. We could do this for any number of species that we've got that people may be of, of uh, either fishery or ecosystem value. Next slide, please. And so one of the things that NOAA Fisheries has also got is a mandate for ecosystem-based fisheries management. And in this case, uh, this is a, a sort of a graphic uh, that comes from our uh, IEA, or Integrated Ecosystem Assessment uh, document that shows the integrated socioeconomic or socioecological system of the Gulf of Mexico. And as we noted, the Gulf of Mexico really is one of those systems that is heavily impacted by industry. It is also heavily, highly productive for its fisheries and its ecosystem. And it's something that's been able to merge all of those. And we've got to consider the cumulative impacts of anything that we do on the system. And I think that in this case, uh, we could probably replace the uh, in the middle there is the oil and gas infrastructure will probably very soon be also needing to add in the wind infrastructure as one of those cumulative ecosystem level impacts if it does reach its full uh, its full potential. Next slide. 
So one of the things that we as an agency have to consider is the scientific impacts on a lot of these species. And, and in this case, we lean on a lot of the work that's got been done in the North Sea. We're also leaning on work done in the Northeast uh, to evaluate the things that could happen. Hydrodynamics could be altered as you remove kinetic energy from the system. You potentially change the oceanography of the system. There's also a lot of sound effects on that could impact a lot of our species, particularly whales and dolphins that use sound uh, for echolocation. There's a lot of vessel activity that's going to occur, and, and then there's electromagnetic magnetic fields that are produced that also have uh, potential and unknown impacts. And then there's also the artificial reef impact, and that's something that we've been studying for a fairly long time in the Gulf of Mexico as oil platforms have provided a lot of artificial reefs that are heavily fished by fishermen, and we do find that they all actually do harbor a lot of our resources. So that's something that uh, we're, we'd like to continue to explore uh, the basic science behind that. Next slide. So one of the things that, we, that is exciting about this is that, uh, is that we have a lot of opportunities here. And as I previous prior slide, Right, and what I'll note that in, in the case of the, hold on, I think we're moved a little further on. We've been actually surveying a lot of these kinds of resources, oil and gas platforms for many years. And we've got a lot of tools to, uh, to bring to the table in terms of remote operating vehicles, as well as acoustic monitoring for a lot of natural resources. These make excellent places to put passive acoustic mon uh, monitoring to be able to detect whales. We can also use environmental DNA as we've used that to detect the birdies whale in the Gulf of Mexico. So there's a lot of advanced tech that we can bring. Here is a video image up where we've got actually camera surveys for a lot of resources on bottom types like reefs that really can't be trawled across. So we can sample and survey these kinds of of very difficult to survey habitats. We've been doing this successfully for a number of years. Next slide. And then lastly, I'd, I'll conclude that there's a lot of opportunities for uh, interagency partnerships. We partnered with BOEM for, for many years in oil and gas infrastructure. They funded a lot of our surveys. We've got strong partnerships with the states through our CMAP surveys, where they actually execute a large number of our surveys. And as I noted, the spatial planning exercise recently done for the aquaculture opportunity areas uh, provides a template for spatial mapping and spatial planning. And so we think that there's a lot of opportunity here to be able to bring uh, different agencies to the table and many of our players and state partners. So next, last slide. And so I'd like to thank Andy Lipsky at the Northeast Fisheries Science, Science Center and Candace Nachman, who's a senior policy advisor for on wind and numerous staff at both the regional office and the Southeast Fisheries Science Center are helping to contribute to this presentation. With that, I'll thank everyone. And I'll mute so that you. Thank you very much, John.